So I want to tell you something very quick before my timer starts, okay? Uh, and that is, this was originally supposed to be an opening at the beginning of the exhibit, right? Um, but COVID had other plans for us and we adapted. Um, the nice thing about this is that in the interim, I've had the great fortune uh, to do a couple of oral histories with the grandson of one of the people that I'm talking about tonight, um, actually to uh, uh, start a friendship with this wonderful family. Um, and so I'm really glad that we ended up being delayed because it's become a very different kind of talk. Uh, so thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, let me go ahead and get started. Uh, so um, I'm going to be talking with you uh, about the Williams family, and I'd like you to imagine at the beginning of this story um, what it was like for J. Andrew Williams, who was 32 years old, who was selected by Booker T. Washington to travel to Chicago to speak before the annual meeting of the National Negro Business League. Um, this is after they got to know each other here um, when Booker T. Washington uh, visited Tampa. Uh, so in his speech, J. Andrew talked about how in 1906, he and his brother Robert had, and I'm going to quote, established a cigar factory run and controlled by Negro men and that would prove of some benefit to my race by giving them employment, end of quote. Now, this statement helps to frame my remarks this evening as aspiring entrepreneurs in Tampa. The Williams family accepted the obligations that Booker T. Washington and other national civil rights leaders placed upon them during the age of Jim Crow segregation. What does that mean? You see it if you go into the exhibit, uh, the loss of black voting rights, the denial of public accommodation, uh, even the denial of basic social services. And so African Americans had to turn to self-help to advance the community's economic and social welfare goals. For Washington, it would be shrewd businessmen like the Williams brothers who would play a central role in this strategy. Black communities would support black businesses and in return, those businesses would reinvest in their communities and forward the progress of the race as a whole. Uh, so if you look at the quote by J. Andrew Williams that's on the slide, you get a clear sense of what's the community contract, right? He says, if every Negro would only smoke cigars manufactured by the Negro cigar makers employed by the Negro firm of the Williams Cigar Company, we would establish a factory that would be a monument to our race and give employment to hundreds of our race. So very lofty ambitions. So for J. Andrew, becoming a leader in Tampa's black community required the performance of middle-class respectability, okay? That has small beginnings. It first required that he was married because you can't really be respectable unless you're married. So in 1910, he married Ida Martin, who was a young woman who had immigrated from the British West Indies. They met conveniently enough in the same building that housed the cigar factory. Ida's sister and brother-in-law leased rooms above the factory, and Ida helped run her sister's laundry business. Now, that already tells you something about her and what it means to be middle class in the black community. You will notice how notions of middle class identity in black Tampa accommodate and typically even demand, usually, black women's employment. Middle class status was not particularly tied to occupation. It came much more from markers like homeownership, community service, the performance of respectability, which conformed to standards of white middle-class morality, okay? Um, the quote on the slide highlights this performance. J. Andrew expressed his support for the temperance movement in Tampa, and he chastised working-class African-Americans who frequ frequented saloons and drank on the Sabbath. Right? Uh, you see that very clearly in the quote from the Tampa Tribune. Now, without denying the clear attempt in this quote to label some members of the black community as disreputable, 
I think it's really important to put this in context, right? If you think about Jim Crow, the foundation of segregation was the assertion that all black people were socially inferior, right? If you think about Plessy versus Ferguson, the fact that you want to prohibit people from buying first class train tickets is the idea that you can't be respectable in middle class if you're black. Right? It's a badge of social inferiority. Uh, and so it's so important that we see in terms of the black middle class in Tampa and elsewhere that their performance of this identity contests the label that's been assigned to them by whites. Now, as we move forward, one of the things I do think you should really emphasize here is how much this man did to invest in his community. In addition to employing African-American workers, he helped found Tampa's Afro-American Civic League and the Tampa Negro Board of Trade. His primary goal was to support the development of more black businesses and to negotiate relationships between the community and local white officials. He also did a lot of other work that I think is really important. He played an important role in raising funds for the construction of a new church for the congregation of St. James Episcopal. And he helped lead a campaign in local black churches to raise money for flood victims in Indiana and Ohio in 1913. So we get a sense of, again, a lot of civic engagement that he sees is his responsibility in his position. Uh, like most middle class community leaders, actually, let me kind of not move this forward quite yet. Yeah. Um, uh, he pursued a very rich associational life that combined sociability, intellectual improvement, moral improvement, with very pragmatic social welfare services. Uh, the example that we have in the exhibit of this kind of fraternal organization is the Dunbar Literary Society. All right? um, the particular organization that you're looking at here has the best name ever. He helped establish the Tampa Home Nest of the Afro-American Order of Owls. Right. Um, and again, you get the sense that it combines, you know, things like intellectual and moral improvement, again, that middle class respectability, with very pragmatic things, uh, receiving health care, elder care, a respectable burial. These were all things that were challenged by the denial of social services. Uh, so as silly as it might seem, the owls really sought to assume part of the burden of these needs in the black community. Okay, uh, so something I think rather profound. Um, in any case, I have to tell the story that I don't like to tell, all right? Um, it's not something that's in the exhibit, uh, but I think it's important for our consideration today. In 1916, J. Andrew Williams faced the first of several challenges um, uh, that would lead to his downfall as a black community leader in Tampa. Uh, remember that William's success had depended on a national retail market, right? He engaged in long-term trade in terms of cigars uh, with both white and black clientele. Now, this business model required him to rely a lot on the dominant system, white government, legal institutions, and that placed him in an increasingly perilous position as segregation lines hardened. So in 1916, J. Andrew sued a customer in another state who hadn't paid, okay? Not only did he not win judgment, but his black attorney was actually disbarred for an administrative filing mistake, which the lawyer perceived to be retribution from a local white politician. Two years later, the Williams Cigar Company was sued by a supplier, and this time J. Andrew was ordered to sell off goods from the cigar company. A year after that, J. Andrew was harassed by federal authorities for supposedly failing to keep proper financial records required for long-term trade. His time in Tampa actually comes to a disturbing end. He left Tampa for New York in 1923, and memory in his family suggests that he'd been threatened by the KKK. Uh, the harassment may have resulted from his decision to sell bootleg alcohol during Prohibition, which he probably undertook 
to basically deal with this decline, right? His business is failing. He'd stopped manufacturing and was just actually selling cigars. Uh, but this led to some really kind of dangerous uh, business associations. Now, one sign of his shifting fortunes is that he actually switched business storefronts with his brother, Robert. And that's what you're seeing on this slide. Two businesses, same building. OK, um, and I think it's really useful. Um, Robert had dissolved his partnership in the cigar company very early 1909 to open up his own business, which was a dry goods store. Uh, originally, the two businesses were adjacent to each other on Scott Street. So J. Andrews business was declining. And at the same time, Roberts was expanding. So leading the two men to switch spaces. Now, this is important because I think it's actually Robert who reveals the business model that was taking hold in Black Tampa in the period as segregation favored businesses that could thrive just with the support of local black consumers. OK, what had not changed, though, was the obligations that business leaders owed the community. All right. So here meet Robert and Lila Williams. This is their wedding photo. It's my favorite photo in the exhibit. Okay, they just look five. They're so young. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Robert and Lila Williams dry goods store uh, becomes fully enmeshed uh, in the lives of local community members. Um, given the fact that they depended on a working class clientele for their business, uh, it's not surprising that we don't see the couple engaging in conversations about issues of public morality. Right? Uh, instead, the dry goods store offered a variety of services that helped their neighbors deal with inadequate and irregular income. So customers bought on credit, and family memories suggest that Williams allowed customers to just pay when they could. The store also allowed customers who were out of work to bring in household items to pawn, right? Things that they didn't use that often. And they could expect that the Williams would hold on to that stuff so that they could actually come back and reclaim them when they were working again. Uh, they also rented residential property with similar forbearance. Uh, so obviously, all of these things created tremendous loyalty. And the Williams were fully enmeshed in local community life. Now, this doesn't mean that Robert eschewed a larger leadership role. A lot of the same organizations that I mentioned, the Afro-American Civic League, the Tampa Negro Board of Trade, he was also one of the founding members. I actually learned about him first. He was the first person I learned about in this exhibit. Y'all don't know the story. Um, because I was in Washington, D.C., looking in the papers of the Library of Congress of the Tampa Urban League, and he was one of the founders of that. Okay, um, so uh, clearly very invested in the expansion of needed social services in Tampa. Okay, now Lila, um, I love this. Okay, she offers, I think, a look at uh, the multiple roles that black middle class women had to juggle. Okay, uh, her daughter remembers that her mother worked in the store. She sometimes supplemented the family income through catering and sewing, and then later during the Depression, even taking in laundry. Uh, women at the same time were expected to be civic leaders and race activists. Not only was Lila very active in her church, but you see her here. I've looked at these photos for years and didn't know she was here, okay? Um, she's uh, in these photos of the Tampa Urban League. She's wearing the dark dress. Um, and she's in the photo of the Helping Hand Day Nursery in the back in a striped dress, right? Uh, so this is a very busy woman. Right? Um, I can't emphasize enough the importance of women to the self-help ideology that was espoused by civil rights activists in the period. Uh, Williams and other women in Tampa um, participated in a very big strategy across the country in black communities. Basically, they saw the denial of public services and responded by starting their own institutions. Right? They make it themselves. But they went further than that. They're political actors. They pressed municipal government to take over at least some funding for these services, which were being provided already to whites. Right? I think in the exhibit, the Clara Fry Hospital is the best example of this, Right, trying to get Tampa to actually take some responsibility. Uh, so uh, women's labor, I think, so, so, so pivotal. Now, this is our last slide. Okay, And Susan, 
this is for you, right? Um, nobody has ever seen this picture of Robert before. This is a family photo that Bentley just sent me. Um, so I'm so excited to be able to like share it with you. Um, he's in his 50s here, y'all. So <laughs> I'll have some of what he's having. Um, so uh, like many black business owners, um, Again, I have to tell a story that's not so great, which is that um, Robert uh, was not able to sustain his business through the Great Depression, right? Um, and hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, the financial crisis revealed the precariousness of so many black institutions, right? Uh, segregation had kept these institutions small, undercapitalized, and so they were the first casualties when the banks closed. Right. Um, so the dry goods store closed in 1933. Lila attempted to operate a restaurant in the same storefront. Robert worked as a tailor for a neighboring business. That solution failed. And so ultimately Robert did what a lot of men did during the Great Depression, which is that he left Tampa to look for work elsewhere, in this case, New York City. Now imagine what this was like for Lila. This decision left her in a very difficult position, trying to force people to like make good on their rents, right? having to make ends meet through paid employment while also engaging in childcare. Uh, it was very much, you know, I think a difficult time uh, for the family. Uh, but I think it's important to tell the story too because it very much shows you a larger pattern. Historians have found that in black communities throughout urban America, working class African Americans felt let down by their community leaders during the depression. And it makes sense. I mean, imagine if you already depended on store credit to make ends meet before the financial crisis, right? Imagine what life is like now when there's no work and these kinds of resources from community leaders are no longer available. Right? Um, so it's not surprising that working class African Americans in Tampa and elsewhere uh, looked for alternative paths to black progress other than what had been espoused by leaders like Booker T. Washington. And in Tampa, it would be Perry Harvey and the Longshoremen's Union um, that would really fill that void. Um, but I would definitely go over the 20 minutes if I talked about that. <laughs> so let me, say, no, let me say this instead, because I want to leave time for people to ask questions, right? Um, so um, my focus on business ownership as a civil rights strategy, right, um, I think has ended up, you know, really kind of emphasizing some of the greatest challenges that were faced by the Williams family. Right. But remember, that's only one way of telling their story. Um, I look at somebody we mentioned very briefly in the exhibit, um, their brother, Willie, who uh, is the guy who worked for the cigar factory that's that's mentioned in the exhibit. Um, as conditions deteriorated, he left for New York and he became a very popular nightclub owner, uh, very, very famous in Broadway. And then again, like a very unrespectable middle class existence. Right. Um, so, again, there's lots of success stories that we could tell and the family has told. And so I think really the challenge for us is to really find more space in our shared history remembrance, right, for these kinds of stories. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to stop. Um, and uh, if you do have any questions, I would love to talk with you. Mm. Please.
Yeah, sure. It's it's something, unfortunately, that, that I would love to have incorporated more in the exhibit itself, but it really took us beyond, you know, kind of uh, um, the story of Booker T. Washington. Um, so we leave off the exhibit in 1915, right, uh, with that big map that you see, which really just shows Central Avenue starting to flourish, right? Um, so again, we see this range of businesses um, like Roberts, although he was on Scott Street, but, but they very much serve vital functions for the black community, right? So I think we have what Patterson's uh, funeral parlor, um, we have the drugstore, I mean, really, again, just like a range of vital services. And, and from those beginnings, you know, we really get this flourishing, flourishing community, right, um, that grows up around Central Avenue. Um, what you also see, if you're familiar with Tampa at all, is how much of that map no longer exists um, because it's all under the highway, you know? Um, for me, my first encounter with that, I've been studying Clara Fry for a long time um, and was devastated to see that that was part of what was actually demolished, right? Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's a very important thing to talk about because, you know, even though my own story focuses on, you know, again, kind of how the Great Depression um, uh, affected certain middle-class leaders. Um, certainly the viability of Central Avenue continues forward, right, uh, into the post-war period. And, and I think, I mean, for me as a historian, I guess what I always come back to again and again is um, we situate memory in space. And if you take away our spaces, it's so hard for us to actually connect to our own experience, you know? Um, so it's such a devastating loss. Um, and for those of you that are not familiar about this, I mean, actually I talked a little bit about this at a, a presentation we did before. Um, this is something that happened across the country, um, is that local uh, um, uh, communities were able to use um, money from the federal government to essentially declare black neighborhoods as blighted meaning no redeeming value at all, and then eliminate the neighborhood. Um, again, no cost to the local community, right, uh, for things like highway construction, right? Uh, and so what it completely did was displace and dislocate uh, a community, right? Um, and to also undermine uh, the black middle class, Right? And I think that's such an important thing to understand because, again, those businesses depended on a local clientele. Right? And so when you destroy space, you have that impact as well. Um, and that was not something that could actually be recovered. You know, so some of the same themes about loss that I talk about in the Great Depression are basically replicated right? Um, as a result of this experience. So yeah, I think it's a very apt comparison. Thank you. <laughs> you know, this is my favorite part of doing these talks. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, somebody always has that reaction, right? Like, so remember the, the, the person who was born in the Claire Fry Hospital, right? Like, you know, I mean, I think we, we yeah, exactly. We always get to have these wonderful personal connections. Thank you. Oh. Anybody else? Please. That's a really good question. So this was a family of entrepreneurs. Right? Um, it actually starts <clears throat> with um, uh, some of the women who came to Tampa um, in kind of like this, this earlier kind of wave of migration um, who had businesses like um, they would sell food at the railroad station, right? Um, they would do catering, they would do laundry. Um, and so they're actually the first entrepreneurs. Uh, and so um, when you look at the Williams brothers, and there were several of them, um, they all basically apprenticed in Ybor City. Um, J. Andrew also talks about studying cigars, I think it was in Boston. Um, but then they pool family resources, right? And so it was originally very much an extended family business that over time he became like the sole proprietor. 
Yeah, but it's one of those amazing stories that I think about early Tampa um, that we should talk about more, um, which is there is this period of opportunity um, that again kind of so quickly comes to an end. Thank you. Yeah, please. Yeah, so they actually were um, born in Florida, just not in Tampa. Uh, yeah, I, and I did not say that. And then Lila was actually from Columbus. Um, and I actually really like that particular story um, because one of the things that you see with Lila that her family talks about a lot, um, and it's so true, I think, you know, as a general pattern in um, black community experiences, is that women stayed very connected to their place of origin. So she used to go back and forth a lot. Family went back and forth a lot. And so they very much kind of kept that migration kind of very open, right? As opposed to something that's just kind of one and done. Yeah. And that, of course, is something that is even pushed forward by, you know, the Great Migration when people, you know, were going to urban locations in the Northeast and Midwest. They always came back, right? And kept going back and forth, you know? So that, that kind of, you know, contact just infuses and informs both those places. You know, and that's one of my favorite things about Tampa. I think we are so fortunate to live in a place that actually has roots in so many other places. You know, um, I think the, the just the breadth of that experience just it's, it's very much kind of who we are. So I know I made a lot out of like what was a very specific question, but it's a great question. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, so, so um, and I can drag Rodney up here too. Um, but, <laughs> so, <clears throat> when you look at the Cuban community, um, you still see the experience of racial segregation, but it does not take place at the same pace as the segregation that is experienced by African Americans. And that's because of the fact that uh, for Cubans in Tampa, right, who are still very much Cubans, right? Cubans perceive Tampa to be part of Cuba, right? Um, but um, the whole purpose of the revolution, at least as espoused by Jose Marti, was to overcome categories of black and white, right? If we can get rid of the Spanish, we can get rid of that kind of racial thinking. Um, now, in some ways, that was overly optimistic, um, but the foundation of a lot of organizations, revolutionary organizations, certainly unions, right, um, was that they prohibited racial discrimination. And so what happened was, particularly in the beginning, when there were still people um, uh, uh, who were Cuban who were in charge of the cigar industry, um, is that even when you see exterior segregation, you do not see segregation on the shop floor. Right? But that's only in Ybor City and West Tampa. Um, and then over the course of time, as white Americans kind of come to dominate the industry, you do start to actually see change. Um, in the exhibit, I think what, what is really helpful is to look at the display of the Marti Maceo Society, right? Um, because they were forced to form a separate organization because essentially they were excluded from Cuban social clubs. And so, again, segregation does happen, and they do actually have to find another way to gain access to the kinds of things that they enjoyed as full Cubans in Tampa. So, again, same phenomenon, different pace. Yeah. So I think both of those to some extent. So, so this was part of an educational tour of Florida. Um, Booker T. Washington did a lot of these kinds of tours through different states in the South, right? And he always had a mission that was, um, um, you know, both, you know, kind of national and local. Um, he's really trying to encourage support for black education and um, black employment 
right? Um, by basically convincing whites of the benefits to them of doing so. And then, of course, at the same time, you know, he's also very much putting forth um, uh, an image of, um, again, like a black middle class, you know, success stories, uh, which is why his traveling party is always so big. It's like doctors and lawyers, educators, right, ministers. Um, so it kind of serves both of those purposes. Um, so that's the reason why he came to Tampa. Um, so it wasn't specific to the black middle class here, but it's very clear that he chose some places and not others. Um, and a lot of that, you know, relates to the fact that Florida um, in certain parts was just too dangerous, you know? Um, he did actually um, um, have a kind of tangential kind of exposure to a lynching while he was touring through the state. Um, he'd had bad experiences in a previous visit, and so there were some places that he specifically avoided. Um, now, I don't know the specific number. Um, uh, I think at the time that um, uh, William spoke, um, about a fifth of the population um, of Tampa was African American. Um, and I don't know the size of the middle class. What I can give you as a kind of general rule of thumb is that um, the black middle class cemented first in the South because of the fact of the phenomena that I described to you, there were more people to support them, right? So it takes a very, very long time in northern cities for the black middle class to move away from service positions like barber to an exclusively white clientele to businesses that could be supported by blacks. That really depends on the Great Migration. Um, so if you really want to look at like early success stories in the black middle class, it would be here, like places like here. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, please. Um, are there any other future plans on how to study about early black lives in Tampa? Um, so, uh, so, so she was asking about future exhibits. Um, am I allowed to say anything about future exhibits? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I feel like you know, it's it's like a Marvel movie or something. Um, <laughs> So, um, our next exhibit um, uh, does not actually have um, a kind of local cast. Um, the, the exhibit that will open up in March uh, is called um, Stop the Presses, Fake News and the War of 1898. Um, now, having said that, what I will tell you is that we do have the opportunity to engage both in the experiences of Buffalo Soldiers, um, and also, I think, particularly relevant to the exhibit, the black press. Um, so the story won't be local, right? Um, but I think it will also be very interesting. Um, and so um, um, I think uh, I would also, you know, kind of recognize, you know, that, that at the moment, I think there's, there's a lot of really good conversation going on about how to actually restore the black experience more central to our public history venues. You know, um, so in addition to the museum itself that's being constructed, right, uh, the work that's also going on over at the Tampa Bay History Center. So um, there's a lot of stuff to actually see right now and coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, but Rodney can. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and just to kind of, you know, circle it back around to the exhibit, I do think this is one of the things that's critically important. You know, if you, if you look in the exhibit, what you'll see in 1912, right? I mentioned that Booker T. Washington's party was like 25 people, okay? They stayed in people's homes. And every stop, they stayed in people's homes, right? Um, so the Jackson House really is basically, you know, kind of part of the growth of the community to the point where they can actually support right, uh, um, uh, people who are traveling and, and needing to travel with dignity. Um, so it's a very, very important to, story to tell and to preserve, right? Um, and, and as we, you know, we were talking before about the importance of physical space, so hopefully we're gonna be able to, exactly, yeah. Uh, I, saw, I saw you get up, are we at that time? <laughs> I've been cut off. <laughs>